Hey, it's Jay, and this is It's Just Science. This is gonna be a video dedicated to air-cooled versus liquid-cooled computers, but we're examining the science behind both these cooling technologies. This isn't really about looking at the numbers, it's really just looking at the science behind and the engineering behind both methods. So we're just gonna start simple and look at the science behind heat transfer in air. Luke, I am your father. And in water. And that's what I call high quality a tool. It's a known fact that hot objects have more kinetic energy than cool objects. And if we put hot objects in contact with cooler objects, or take that energy away, then energy is transferred as thermal energy, or heat. The truth is, air is not very good at absorbing temperature. Just think of a spring or fall day where it's warm during the day, and then at nighttime, if there are no clouds, it gets super cold because all the heat escapes up through the atmosphere because none of the atmosphere itself absorbs heat. Whereas if that warm spring day has clouds in the evening, then it remains a lot warmer because the cloud cover, or the water vapor, will actually keep the heat in and won't allow it to escape into space. If you do the math, our oceans absorb approximately a thousand times more heat than our atmosphere. When we compare the atmosphere and all the oceans, we can see that the atmosphere has a mass of 5 times 10 to the 18th kilogram, whereas the oceans have 1.4 times 10 to the 21st kilograms. The oceans are much, much more massive, but the oceans also have a much higher specific heat capacity, which means in order to change each by one degree Celsius, atmospheres would need 5.025 times 10 to the 21st joules per Celsius, whereas oceans would need 5.53 times 10 to the 24th joules per Celsius. This just goes to show that a thousand times more energy would have to go into our oceans to raise them by one degree than would have to go into our atmosphere to raise it by one degree. Just think about people who live on the coast versus inland. People on the coast usually have a much cooler climate than people who live inland. And that's only because the ocean itself will absorb a lot more heat from the land since people who live on the coast are so close to the ocean. Whereas inland, the land itself continues to absorb heat. The air is not going to absorb the heat off the land. And there's no ocean there to absorb the heat off the land. So therefore, it ends up being a lot hotter. Here's a demo to show you what I mean. I have a plastic bag filled with air. I couldn't find a balloon. And what I'm going to do is put heat under it. And I don't know if you saw that, but immediately the bag broke and the air started to leak out. It wasn't a dramatic pop like a balloon, but I have a bag of water. And what you guys can see here, by the way, I'm right over my desk. So what's going on here? Water absorbs heat very well. And although water has quite a bit of kinetic energy itself, it absorbs that kinetic energy, that energy from this flame. Whereas air doesn't. So because air is not absorbing it, what else is there to absorb the energy? Well, this plastic bag absorbed it, and that's why immediately there was a hole burned in it. This is why air-cooled computers have huge heat sinks attached to fans because the metal absorbs heat and the fan blows the heat away. Just like a cool breeze across your skin in the summertime. In a computer, the high kinetic energy of a hot CPU is always trying to reach thermal equilibrium with whatever it's in contact with, water or air. But as long as it's running, it continues to produce heat. Both air-cooled and liquid-cooled computers use two methods of heat transfer, conduction and convection. Conduction is where solid materials of different temperatures are in contact with one another and exchange heat energy. Conduction, I feel the heat leaving my hand. And there's convection, which is a fluid like gases or liquids moving heat from one location to another, hot to cold. Can you guess where the conduction is? If you guess here, and these heating pipes where they touch the aluminum fins, you're correct. The heatsink base is in direct contact with the CPU. And this is where the heat originally leaves the CPU and travels into these heat pipes, which then is dissipated into these aluminum fins. As heat bleeds off the aluminum fins, this is where convection comes in, because then the fan takes that hot air and it moves that hot air and transfers that heat out of the heat sink. So more hot air can continue to replace the hot air that's just removed. So if you have an individual fin with no fan, no air is moving, so therefore there can't be any heat transfer. So heat continues to build up and build up and build up on the fin until eventually the CPU burns out. When you add a fan 
You have the hot aluminum fins that absorb the heat from the heat pipes, but then the fan blowing across those aluminum fins create a laminar flow of heat removal, pushing hot air out of the way. If you notice, the heat pipes themselves are placed in alignment with the greatest flow area of the fan. This is engineered this way on purpose because you want maximum heat removal from the hottest place on the heat sink. So what is a heat pipe? A heat pipe is a copper tube sealed under a partial vacuum and filled with a small amount of fluid, usually deionized water. As the pipe is heated from the CPU, and because the pipe has a partial vacuum, it has a lower pressure, which makes it easier for the fluid to change from a liquid to a vapor. Aluminum heat sinks cool the other end of the heat pipe where vapor condenses. The fluid moves back towards the heat source through something called a capillary action. There's a capillary flow, usually inside these heat pipes, there's some sort of wick. And that wick gives the fluid the ability to flow against gravity in a narrow space. You can see in this example with a paper towel, dipped in water with food coloring, what's going on here. The water is spreading up the paper towel and fighting against gravity. And the water line on the paper towel is much higher than the level of water in the bowl. This is the same way the capillary forces act inside of a heating pipe. There's a great cohesive force inside water. But in this case, the adhesive force to the side of the pipe in the wick is greater than the polarized cohesive force of the water molecules. In liquid-cooled computers, there's also a base that's in contact with the CPU, and that transfers heat through conduction. And that heat sink is attached to, in this case, liquid, which is the fluid that's transferring heat through convection. The liquid picks up heat as it moves across the heat sink base, and then continues to take that heat away. I wasn't sure which way the loop of liquid was flowing, so what I did is I used my infrared thermometer and tested the temperatures of all the pipes going in and out of the CPU and graphics card. Once I was able to tell the temperature difference, it was really easy to tell the direction of flow. Cooler going in and hotter coming out. Liquid flows top to bottom through the pump. It goes through the water block below the graphics card and then up right into the radiator. After it goes through the radiator, it comes out cool and it goes right into the CPU. There's a big difference between the liquid going into the water block of the CPU and coming out of the CPU, about eight to 10 degrees Fahrenheit. And then the liquid goes back into the pump reservoir and the cycle continues on and on. The way the radiator works is much like a heat sink on an air-cooled computer. You have hot liquid flowing into one side of the radiator, and it's passed through very thin pipes that are in contact with either copper or aluminum V-shaped fins. Those fins absorb the heat through conduction, and then there's fans behind those metal fins that blows through just like a heat sink, and then remove the heat through convection. As the liquid passes all the way to the end of the radiator, there's a U-turn, and then it passes back through the radiator on the other side. By the time it leaves the radiator, it's cooled down several degrees, and then in my case, in my computer, it goes right from the radiator and passes through the CPU. So the coolest liquid in the loop is actually passing right into the CPU. I think it's about time we wrap things up here. We've taken a look at the science and engineering behind air-cooled and liquid-cooled computers. So for the finale, let's just do a quick pros and cons list. For air-cooled, let's do the pros first. It's really easy to hook up. It's just really plug in, use the thermal paste, put it on, clip it in, plug it into the motherboard, and boom, it's ready to go. Also, one of the pros for air-cooled is that it's super cheap. It's much cheaper than liquid-cooled. On the other hand, some of the cons are, the aesthetics of an air-cooled computer is just not as nice. You've got a huge aluminum heat sink that covers half your motherboard. So in that category, as far as the aesthetics go, it's definitely a con. Also, the specific heat capacity of aluminum copper is very low, which means that it absorbs heat very, very well, but it has a hard time of dissipating. So unless your fans are running hard, you're gonna have a ton of heat inside your computer. You need to have those fans moving the heat out, which is gonna heat up your room in turn. Overall, an air-cooled computer is gonna run a lot hotter. In the case of a liquid cool computer, let's do the cons first. The cons are it's more expensive, anywhere from two to five times more expensive than the parts that you can get for an air cool computer. You also have more mechanical parts in your computer. You've got the pump reservoir, the pump, the radiator, the water blocks, and all the piping in between. It's a lot harder to set it up, and there's a lot more mechanical things that could potentially go wrong. If you're new to building computers, and you mix and mingle some of the parts, like aluminum and copper, for example, because the liquid's flowing through, it's able to carry current, and those two metals have a great electric potential difference, creating a voltage inside the computer. And over time, what ends up happening is electrons from the aluminum will actually jump off, go in, and plate themselves on the copper parts of the system. So it ends up eroding away at the aluminum inside, the, inside your casing. You wanna make sure that when you set it up, everything is protected against those things. Most of the time, if you stick with one manufacturer, you're gonna be fine because they've done all the tests on it already. 
but just be aware that's in my book another check in the con list because it's a little extra homework you have to do in order to make sure that everything matches up perfectly. Finally, the pros of liquid cold. Number one, it's gonna be much more efficient. There is no question that water can absorb a lot more heat than air, copper, and aluminum because the specific heat capacity is much higher. And the reason for that is because of the hydrogen bonding in the water. Water is polar, so all water molecules are bonded together by little hydrogen bonds. Those hydrogen bonds have a lot of energy that hold them together. And what happens is when heat hits those hydrogen bonds, it immediately tries to use its kinetic energy to break up those hydrogen bonds. Instead of attacking the water molecule itself, it's attacking the bond between the water molecules. Therefore, the bond, the hydrogen bond, absorbs a ton of kinetic energy without actually changing the temperature of the water molecule itself. This alone is the reason why liquid cool computers are so much more efficient and can take away and absorb a lot much more heat energy. In fact, the CPU and the, and the graphics cards are gonna put out the same amount of heat, but air cool computers, the heat sink is gonna absorb that energy, get super hot, that aluminum is gonna be hot to the touch, whereas liquid cool computers, if you put your hand right on the piping, it's gonna be a lot cooler, and it's just the liquid is superior in cooling it off. The heat sink will do its job, but the fans are gonna run harder, your computer's gonna be louder, and it's gonna be harder to dissipate that heat and get it out of the case. When we talk about the potential of overclocking a computer, liquid cooled is gonna be the way to go because even if you're overclocking it and the CPU increases in temperature, it's barely gonna change the, the temperature of the fluid running through your computer. Not to mention, liquid cool computers look pretty sweet. Will air cool computers get the job done? Is the engineering sound and really great? Absolutely. But is liquid cool computers the way to go if you have the budget for it? In my opinion, I would say yes. I want to give a quick shout out to Overkill Computers. I want to thank them for allowing me to use some of the computer footage during this video. If you're in the market to buy a custom computer, go check them out on Facebook, Instagram, or their website. Thanks, and that's it from It's Just Science. Hands for Hire is a mobile app connecting neighbors ready to lend a hand with neighbors who need a hand. Download now in the App Store or on Google Play. Visit us at handsforhire.com. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to this channel.